Okay, welcome back everybody. Now, I, I just said to Alex that I talked about him already at the beginning of the lecture. And we talked a little bit about being a CSR manager in a social business, okay. which is probably not the typical role of a person in a social business. And we've seen the CSR manager of Coca-Cola last week here. So we said that probably the work that you do is very different from the work that Axel Bachmann is doing, or maybe also not. <laughs> and we can discuss the roles that CSR managers have in different types of organi organizations a bit more. And what I also teased a bit is that you are also working with big businesses for your social business. And this also incurs really interesting influence processes. So maybe we can at the end have a couple of questions about that from the audience because now everybody's already towards the end of the semester super educated on CSR topics. And I think there will be a lot of interesting questions. So Alex and me, we know each other for a very long time already. You probably can say uh, a little yeah. bit about the background, how we work together. I'm very happy that you are here. And we always received very good uh, feedback about your talks here. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to hearing what has happened in, uh, in, <laughs> in the organization since your last talk. Thank you for being here. And the stage is yours. OK. Thanks for the low expectations. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I, I love being here. Um, I always like how the group thins out and all the rest of the motivated people are still here. And one guy who I actually pays, as my, my colleague is here today, if you, if you don't want to ask me questions, you can ask him. He's been working for me um, the last one and a half weeks. So he's very, very fresh on the job. So ask him a lot of questions so he learns a bit. Um, do you have any questions before I start ex explaining anything? I wanted to open this because before I bias you all, you guys, do you have any questions to a CSR guy now? Maybe in expectation of any exams or something? Good. If you do have any questions, just um, interrupt me um, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, just to myself a little bit, um, I've been working in CSR about five and a half years now. Um, I, I started off. Um, as a student in, in Bochum, that's where I know, there you are, um, no, these group of lots of Bochumer people here, um, where I, I um, worked in a, in a um, student organization where we had very close relations to social entrepreneurship and corporate responsibility. I worked at a large consulting firm um, where I got kicked out because it was unsustainable um, from, a, from the sustainability department, basically. And then I went into a different um, IT um, consulting where we attempted to install sustainability in a context. It didn't work, basically. I failed again. Um, and now I've been a CSR manager for four and a half years in one company. And it's a long, hard road, but it's working. And it's getting even better. Um, and that's the big change. Last year, I was standing here. I was quite fr frustrated. I think that's one of the main objectives I share with Coca-Cola. Um, you have to have a high, high tolerance in frustration in CSR management. Because as you just learned, the bosses are mo mostly the evil guys. And we have to work with and sometimes against them and find creative ways of establishing sustainability within an organization. Um, as you heard, I work for a social enterprise. It's a bit of a different context, but basically we are a classical um, enterprise with a slightly different focus. I'm going to um, attempt to, to go into topic on that. I'm going to explain a little bit of how cool we do our CSR management. It's, I just wanted to give you some glimpses. There are tons of topics. I've got tons of slides. I'm not going to go into big detail. Because I want to show you we're a, a small company, um, but we have a huge responsibility in the market. And we can now channel this, this responsibility a little bit. And the last thing I wanted to show you is a change I've been observing. And that's where me as a small enterprise representative has an even larger impact on the market as well, because there's a huge change in the moment. Um, and 
when you enter the, you might enter the um, sustainability arena, um, you'll already be confronted with the um, results of that approach. Um, basically, what our core business is, um, and it's very simple and it hasn't changed over the last um, 15 years, we take computers, we erase them, and we sell them again. Very simple business. About um, 14 and a half years ago, a customer came to our founder and said, Paul, I got computers, I gotta get rid of them. I don't care where they go, I don't care what happens to them. Dig a hole, put them in there, close it, don't tell anybody where the hole is. Data security wasn't an issue, environmental impact, nobody cares, IT guys are not really that sustainable anyway. So he looked, how can we erase the computers? And he found a way, um, not too far from here in Freiburg, um, with, a, um, with a workshop for disabled people. These guys took the computers, they erased them, and it's a very, very simple but straightforward process. You take it, you erase it, you hand it over. You take it, you erase it, you hand it over. And these guys in that disability workshop, they liked it because they were not sorting gummy bears from one place to the other or building pencils or something. They were now working in an IT company or for an IT company. And those guys are still working for us and they're still doing the same job. And they love it because now they don't get charity, they get a wage. They don't have guys who are stuck with them in this workshop, they got work colleagues. And they're working in an international company. Because since then we've grown a little bit um, and we, we still do the same thing as in the beginning. We work for large corporations, about a thousand in Europe, in 16 countries, and we take back their computers, erase them and sell them again. S simple thing. What I said, we're now international. We're working in 16 countries all over Europe. We have locations in France, Switzerland, Austria and Germany. Um, and last year we, w we grew about 30%. So we're, we're a very, very fast moving company because all of you have computers at your homes. They're not that good like in companies, but the companies, they actually take the computers and they're not broken. They're not, there's nothing wrong with them. Like this computer here, it's basically one and a half years old. In a half a year, the company IT guy would say, I don't need them anymore. I need a new thing because my guarantee is run out get rid of them. And that's when we come in. We take the computers, we raise them, and we sell them again because the devices are not broken. In 75%, we can take the computers, just erase them, and sell them again within a very short time period. In some cases, we have to recycle them. Basically, what we do, we take all the core components out, what we can use, and then we put it into the, the recycling guys. Yes? Um, Yes, in, in, in some cases we, we have three business models basically. Um, if you're a very sustainable company like the GLS Bank, your computers are so old, we actually take money from you because we can't do anything with it. If you're a company um, that thinks, okay, there's a, a small fee or the rest of, of money on the, on the computers, I could sell them, but I have to have the service of data erasure. We don't, we basically, don't charge each other anything. In some cases, if you work like in an in a, a advertising agency or in a university, you only have MacBooks, we actually pay for the computers because we know at the end of the day we can sell them for a higher price. But our, our services um, endure a lot of costs in the, in the center. And normally companies try to do them themselves and then they approach us at, the, at some point where we do that. So there is, that's where the money flows a little bit. I'll show it later. Yeah. Yes. Um, we upgrade computers many times, not always, because like this device doesn't need an upgrade. It's fast enough. And you're not our target audience. You don't like our computers. They're heavy and they're ugly, right? You like MacBooks, you like small, thin. We don't have that. We got the ugly, fat ones because, because they work in the, in the companies, right? And the companies, well, at some point you're going to work in a company, you're going to one of those devices, right? Um, so um, we do upgrade it. We have about 15 people doing nothing else but upgrading. Um, it's, if you speak German, die wünsch dir was Abteilung. Um, so we, we make lots of happiness into computers because some devices need upgrades. They're old, 
right? We have devices where you can open them, you've got a, still got a floppy disk or the big disk, I don't know what the name is, or really freaky old stuff, right? So we do upgrade it because at the end of the day, when we remarket them in our locations, you can go to Karlsruhe, you can go to Cologne, you can go to Berlin, you find a normal store where everybody can buy a computer. As I said, you're not the target group. Our age demographic is normally 60 plus, right? I don't want to say your parents because they're probably younger than that, but uh, your grandparents maybe, um, are our demographic where they buy computers. Or special people who know computers buy ours because that we, we have extremely good devices. You can, you can pour water on it, you can drive a car over it, it won't break, right? But it's heavy. That's a, that's a different. Um, and what we do um, is basically um, we sell to lots of nonprofit organizations. Around 10,000 nonprofit organizations bought computers last year from us, um, around 4,000 schools. I'll show it later. Um, so we have a very, very good distribution part in Europe. And that's one speciality we, we actually do because we have a very, very long value chain, what we um, can ensure. Um, our speciality is, that's because we're called AFB. AFB is German and stands for um, Workplaces for People with a Disability, Arbeit für Behinderte. Um, so, on the one hand, every time we take a computer back, erase it and sell it again, we make little money and can ensure that the employees who might be a, a person with a disability or a person without um, can keep their job. So, the more we grow, the more computers we get, the more we sell, the larger our workforce gets, and always 50% of our labor force is a person with a, with a disability. And that not in one department, in every department. From logistic to the bosses to every part department, apart from the sustainability department. I'm the only guy not, I haven't found a guy, a female person who works in, disability, uh, in, in sustainability with a disability, because I'm not allowed to ask. So, and my headhunters are not finding people. So we have a large, large social impact because we employ lots and lots of people with a disability. On the other hand, every time you take a computer and you resell it again, you don't have to build a new one. Even if the market share for devices grows a little bit, it's still better than going to the, to the mine somewhere in Africa, getting all the stuff out of the ground, going to China, killing some, some kids, and then importing it to, to Europe. You don't have to do that because the devices are still fully fully functional and they, they work so we can actually reduce the carbon footprint as well. Yes? No. Um, I would even say if we, us two sit down in a special department with two, two, uh, against two disabled guys, you're going to cry because you're too slow. Um, I got, my favorite is Thomas. You guys, I told this story about 100 times. Thomas is a guy, he's deaf, right? He hears nothing, he's cheeky as shit, right? Um, he's deaf, so he doesn't hear anything. He used to work in construction in building roads. And you know the jackhammer? He kind of killed his ears. Um, and what he now has, because he's disabled, nobody wanted to give him a job. He came to us and he said, guys, I'm disabled, I, didn't, I need a job. So we looked at him and said, what can you do? And that's the difference in the recruiting process. We look at the people, what they can actually do. We don't have it like a mask where you have to enter stuff and you get kicked out. Looking at Thomas, we found out that he's an extreme good worker. He, he, he's in data erasure, he's really good. Especially when, um, because his, his um, sense of touch is heightened. And we have a large machine where the, where the disks get shredded up into tiny little pieces. So he puts his hand on the machine. He actually feels that the machine is going to break. So he stops the machine, he repairs the machine, and it keeps on working. So his downtime of his machine is 20% less than anybody else. So his productivity is 20% higher. So we can actually measure the impact of his disability on his job. So he's much more productive than us two. Because we wouldn't, we wouldn't hear it. It's a very, very slight, because the machine is so strong, it kills itself. And that's why his production is way, way higher. And I hope his wage is higher too. I haven't asked him yet. But in that case, we have so many people with a special talent we actually employ. 
people with and without a disability who actually, and we try to ask them, what can you do and how can we harvest this in the, in the job? Yeah. Well, any company who hires disabled people has to pay wages and they get a little subsidy. Everyone. And normally, companies have to pay um, a fee because they don't hire enough people with a disability. And this, how do you call it? Zwangsabgabe? This fee um, is contributed into companies like us. When you hire people with a, with a disability, we get a little subsidy. But if you think about it, we had to, Thomas, because he doesn't hear anything, what if fire occurs? So we have lights everywhere. He is now a smartwatch when the doorbell rings. When the doorbell rings, his smartwatch goes beep, beep, beep. He, no, it doesn't go beep, beep, beep. It, <laughs> it, right? It moves. So he actually knows that somebody's at the doorbell and he can open the door. Right? So we have to do lots of other constructions so he's actually in, integrated, included in the whole business. Right? And that's what the most companies don't actually do. That's why there is a wage difference, but in some cases, people are not that productive. They only work four hours real time, but they're there eight hours because they're not that productive. But they're great, what they do, right? And these other four hours are subsidized at some point, but that's what any company would get in Germany, right? So there's a difference, but at the end of the day, those guys go home with a normal wage like everybody else. They don't know the difference, I hope. They know it, but they don't see it on the paycheck, right? Um, so, very strong two impacts, social and environmental, environmental because we, we um, increase the lifespan of the devices. And what we actually do since, since 2015, um, we actually look at some indicators, like how many locations do we have, how many employees do we have, what's the rate of disability in our company, because that's our core mission, to employ people with a disability. We actually want to grow to, towards a company with 1,000 employees, of which 500 are people with a disability. Um, we work with here it says around 700, actually it's 1,000, but not every company works with us every year, so it's, uh, it's around 1,000 companies. Um, we handled 280,000 devices last year. Now it's November, we already, we already exceeded that one because we're growing again um, about 20% this year. Um, mobile phones, that's my project. I'm kind of, I'm hoping to get rid of it, but my um, sales department, they, they think I have to do it. Um, we are now in 1,200 locations in Germany and are collecting around 80,000 mobile phones from private people. Like if you go to O2 shop today, you throw in your mobile phone, it'll land in our company within the next two weeks. Right? So we have 1,200 locations and a very clean process and now it's around something around 80,000 devices. And we started that project two years ago. Right? So it's growing in a vast business in a vast way. And we did around 4,000 pickups. That's something we do apart from our competitors. We actually have a whole fleet of cars, trucks, huge, huge trucks with trailers and everything where we pick up the devices ourselves because we want to guarantee that our customers know where the devices are. We don't want to have um, ex external people or third parties um, transporting the devices. And what I said, we, we sell the, the most part of the devices to private people. But a large part goes to schools, to nonprofits, and so on. And what we, what we do, we extremely um, reduce the carbon footprint um, in our society. We compare this once, and now I take a VW, because I like the pun in, in, below it. Um, we, we, um, we can reduce the amount of carbon um, dioxide by the same amount. You could drive 60,000 kilometer with a i3, but that's with a diesel motor. So it's a huge, huge, huge amount. That's a basically, you can drive to Mars and not come back. Um, what we did this year, and, and um, some of you um, took this seminar with Adidas as well, where we talked about this in very depth. Um, we tried to find out what is our social return on invest. It's a bit tricky and you can take it apart within like three minutes, but it's an indicator where we actually create a social impact on our society. So what we did, we calculated everything what we put into the company and looked what was the societal impact that came out. So we employed people, we had a social inclusion function, so we had a 
a function where we actually help include people in our society. We had um, the component of digital inclusion, where we actually give access to digital media, like to senior citizens, people who just don't have that much money because they can buy our devices. And the, la the biggest part was the environmental protection. So that's a huge, huge impact we have in our local societies. We did that in Hannover. We would love to scale this if somebody actually would do that. So if you want to write a master's thesis or something, um, you can do that. It's a long, long job, and I hope I learn from you guys how to do it. Um, but what you can see here, you can actually monetize the impact. And I said, you always have to look at it with a, with a blinking eye um, because you can take it apart. But it is a good indicator of what we actually do for society as a normal business. Yes. Uh, how do you monetize the business? <laughs> it's basically an Excel that's this big, right? I can show it to you. Um, it's, it's a method where you try to find proxies um, which are monetized. Um, like, it's very, very basic example. If I give you a piece of chocolate and you tell me you're more happy after the chocolate, I can take the, the money spent for the chocolate to monetize your happiness. That's behind that. It's a bit more sophisticated. It took eight months and two consultants from a large consulting company who mentored us, but that's the base, very, very basic principle behind this. You look at what is your, might your impact be, in, and then you look at proxies, and then try to monetize it. Here, the environmental impact is based on, on carbon pricing. Very simple. That the, was the easiest part. That's why it's so, so big. Yeah. You would, yeah, um, you would think that um, these computers are not more, uh, the margin of I energy efficiency just, they reach their peak, that you can't get more energy out of, or use less energy with the devices. The worst thing is um, not the device, it's the, the charger. They're awful. They're, they're really awful. They're getting worse by the year. So you even have a, a other effect that nobody's looking at the charges in the moment. But we calculated this. We took, um, it's called a life cycle assessment. We took the whole life cycle of the device and chopped it into pieces and we found out what our part is. Um, you'll see it in a moment. I, I put it in the, in, the, in the part of our own carbon footprint. The worst part is not in our company, it's the usage phase of our devices. So basically exactly what you said. But the usage phase is still better than building a new one. In all cases, yeah. How did you, so, so did you somehow account for the, um, the cycling process? Or, like, what, what was the uh, take the computer and sort of throw it away or recycle it? Yeah. We, we looked at that as well. Um, we looked at the, the comparison usage and recycling as well. And um, with a mobile phone, you got an old Nokia 3210 where you can play snake on it, right? 97% um, is plastic. It gets thrown in the, in, the, in, the, in the heating, what do you call it, the big furnace, you get all the plastic out. It's awful, right? And we looked at that and we found out that the, the burning of the material, even if you go the gold, nickel, and everything out of it, is really awful. It's better than throwing it in the, in the tip somewhere. But the usage phase, if we can erase the data of that device and use it longer, it's always better than recycling. But, and we, the, the main thing is we just extend, extend the life cycle about two to four years, and then the recycling part comes anyway. And that's in our life cycle assessment in that part anyway. So we looked at it, but the extension of the life cycle is always better than just throwing it away or something. So that's what we found out. I hope I'm right on that one. Yes, of course. No, it's two euros 27. Yes. Yeah. 
So every, that's the blue thing basically down. That's the, the many one euros, I think it's 600,000 euros invested and the rest is just going up, right? And you always have to just, it's an indicator. It's not the truth and it's not, if we do it again in Hanover this year, it's gonna to be totally different. So we have, that's one of our challenges to find a model where we can actually um, transfer this to, to other places. Um, I want to talk a bit about the CSR management because you, you saw that we are a social enterprise, but we are very, very entrepreneurial in our core business. This social and environmental impact is a side note. I don't want to put it, but that's the way we work because we are a very strong enterprise which are with a very strong and strong and environmental um, case. You've probably seen this from other guys um, who are our stakeholders, who are the important guys. Um, little side note, tomorrow is my um, stakeholder dialogue where I invite 25 of those guys um, to Frankfurt where we meet to actually um, to develop our uh, CSR management and you'll see something that has not been seen in public. Um, Dominic and I just looked at it about 20 minutes ago because I finished it 21 minutes ago. So um, these guys are going to uh, look at it tomorrow and that's our materiality matrix. We are still the first social enterprise in Germany doing this. We are one of the only ones in, uh, who has a CSR manager. Um, and what we did, we, we are trying to go to an international standard because now we're reporting as a, as a German company with locations everywhere else with a German codex. Very simple, very basic. Dominic's gonna do it the next four weeks. That's one of his jobs, very simple. Now what we're trying to do is that what every other corporate has to do we're going to attempt that to do that next year. It's a big, big, big job, and that's why um, we're hiring another person in the next months to help with that. And the first step is to find what are your topics, right? To narrow it down, to not get run around and do weird stuff. So the main focus is to look, and that's where our company puts in a lots of energy, is the impact on the society, the environment, and economy. So we kind of focus on that. We know lots about that. And on the other hand, we ask um, around 300 people, what's our influence on them, on their decision making? So that's what we found out, um, and the deadline is 32 minutes ago. Um, I took the, all that data and put it in there and evaluated it and, and found this metrics. So now I know that our, our, the biggest impact we have and the influence of our stakeholders in the, is the inclusion of people with and without a disability. But that's our core business. That's, I think that's what differentiates us from a large company. We're not gonna worry about inclusion, right? We're gonna worry about other t topics. And one, a couple of topics I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Um, we set goals um, strongly based on customer relations because everything we do is basically built on those peer development processes. Everything what we, we attempt, we do with a partner because we don't have large budgets, we don't have large manpower to do stuff. So we always think, okay, what, when we develop something, how can we do it with somebody else, right? So it's very strongly built on, on, on corporate joint development. Um, it's a very strong internal case is um, leadership. Um, we are a social enterprise, so the leadership um, and the the managers in our company have a different responsibility. Normally, a manager always has to look at the business case, drive business, look at the people on the side. In our case, we have people with a schizophrenia, depression, total different leading style. This is something we developed and I, I just participated because I have no clue about this. This is our social workers built this. I loved it because they built a, um, um, inclusive leadership workshop, what we are now transferring to our corporate partners because they have no clue about leading teams where they have people with a disability inside. So we're kind of transferring that as well. Um, what we try to do, um, I try to find an intern from this university as well. Um, we said we're, we're sending lots of our interns from my team to other com companies, mostly our customers. After the third time that happened, I kind of got annoyed because the knowledge transfer didn't happen. So I said to, to large companies, I said, why don't we look for two interns and after three months we'll swap and then we've got a huge great knowledge exchange and we'll give you guys a really cool internship for six months, full semester. 
Problem was, HR didn't like that because it's weird. They don't understand that. They don't like it, right? So what we did, um, and we, we actually found somebody who um, just one and a half weeks ago left my team, um, worked with a, um, a CSR consulting company in Berlin. Um, so she started off in my team. She worked in, uh, in Berlin for three months, and then I was the most happiest prior boss ever because she came back. So the knowledge transfer I was hoping for actually happened. This person was first kicked out of the recruiting process because she has no clue about sustainability, right? But I told the guys from the consulting, I'm gonna train her because she's a huge, huge asset because she has a clue about everybody, everything else but sustainability. And she's now working for a nonprofit a company in Munich. Um, she's very successful. I'm, I'm very happy that she started in that company because Within that time frame, about a year, she learned how the system works and how to, to um, run, run um, a CSR department. And this is what I basically uh, told you, that we looked at our emissions. Where do we have our carbon footprint? Where's the biggest one? So what we do, because we take back the computers and there's uh, lots of vehicles, we have a couple of percent um, of emissions in our internal company. The worst thing is, and that's the weirdest thing, is when our customers use the devices. But I'm not gonna tell my customers, hey, buy a computer, but don't use it. That won't happen. So how can I reduce my carbon footprint? I have no clue yet, right? If you have a good idea, come to me later. But um, what we did, and this is um, in Austria, we looked, what do, does our service actually um, basically have an, a higher reduction part, and then it's true. We reduce the carbon footprint more than we actually use um, carbon emissions. Um, one project that we are working on, and it's getting a pain because it's not finished yet, um, because we work with a, a very large social enterprise, and we work with lots of corporates, and we try to connect those two worlds in the moment. Um, it's an ongoing project um, with lots and lots and lots of companies where we actually try to combine those worlds in, in great parts, even though we're a very small company. We're only now we're around about 300 people. And how big of an impact have we, do we have in our society with only 300 people? Right? Um, and in our, our CSR management, we have the clear agenda to actually work with our customers. And these are the huge, huge, large corporate corporates. So we are trying to attempt to go there where they are because we are actually working alongside with them. We're living, uh, delivering lots and lots of data for them. Um, and that's where we have to keep on going. Um, and what I want to talk about a little bit is uh, in the following is about two things. How a small company can have a large impact and then this change in the in the CSR scene in the moment. When you think about, about um, IT devices, right? Um, you all use them at any point of time. You have a mobile phone, you have a tablet, you have a, have a um, notebook, you have a computer, your TV is your fridge, whatever, right? So your demand is reaching the companies in Northern Europe, Asia, and so on, and mostly the devices um, are designed somewhere in Asia. Then all the resources, are come, they come from South America, Africa, Australia, wherever. They go to China and the, the devices are built, right? Oops. But the usage phase is here again. So it's a global, huge supply chain in those devices, right? And the, I know that um, Interpol has large studies that m about 60 to 70% of all devices in Europe go to Africa. And you all know this picture with the, what's in the Spiegel, always in, in autumn, with a kid with a lighter, and he's taking out all the copper and gold of those devices. It's a really awful, awful story. So at the beginning, where we are in the coal mines, in the, in the bauxite mines and whatever, you have um, social problems, and at the end, you generate them again. And with our business model, we can actually reduce this problem at the end. We can't reduce at, begin, at the beginning. We are trying to do that now. But our biggest impact we can have is channel, channeling the devices that they don't go to Africa. We have 
300,000, 400,000 devices this year where we can channel them into cleaner places. Because in Europe, we don't have kids with a lighter taking out the copper, right? We don't have that. And if we even sell it to Albania or whatever, the usage phase is there and we can ensure there's a recycling process. We are now actually, uh, since a couple of months, a couple of years, um, working with a company who take computers or notebooks in private luggage, take them to a, a, th a developing country so that people can use them, and they installed a system that they actually take the broken devices back so that the, the junk doesn't stay in those countries. Because those countries don't have recycling processes um, where it takes place. And on the other side, so we have a large, we can change the whole system. And by talking about it, we can hopefully change a whole system that is actually exporting by the minute. Tons and tons and tons of devices. And on the other hand, we're actually talking to lots of um, people who design the devices. So we're, we're leapfrogging the whole usage phase so we can um, impact on those guys as well. So they build devices we can repair and recycle very, very easily. Um, because this is basically the whole channel. We, we, we're taking a thousand value chains of IT and um, we're collecting it. And so we're looking that we put them into the, the, the B2C market, in the, in the consumer market, and not into the, the wholesale market. Um, we're now working with, with ministries and development agencies um, where we actually take our business model and scale it or transfer it to a different country. We're now um, in a process where we um, are talking to a development agency in Uganda, Rwanda, sorry, um, to clone our whole business model to the continent. So they build the whole model with remarketing and recycling right on the local system. Yeah, you get, you get margins from African wholesalers, not big ones. There's a huge, huge, and there's a business case, and that's the problem. That's why we, we're trying to grow and increase our business case, because it's a bit cleaner. We, we've done, we've sold computers to guys coming from those countries. And I don't know if we still do. But we built a system where the pricing is too high so they don't want to do it. We built a system where we actually ask them not to pay cash. Very basic, not to pay cash. They have to have a, a license in Europe. So very basic, so the, the whole market, and we only sold to about 15 um, wholesalers, it's already reduced to guys we like. And where we can go there, we can look at their plant and know where their devices go. And we actually, that's what I'm, um, when we're doing in the beginning of the year, we're um, hiring a person building, finishing this system because it's very, very basic now. And we want to develop this system and we want to open it to our competitors so they build the whole system like we do. Maybe they've already done something, but we want to talk to them and say, there's a huge problem. We have, we have um, a negative social impact on these, in these developing countries and we have a resource scarcity here in Europe. How stupid is, is it to send all those stuff down there? We already got it here, right? Why not keep it here and maybe flourish the industry for IT business down there? Help them do other business down there. Because we might have a negative impact because it might cost jobs if we don't send them IT anymore. But maybe other jobs will be created. Maybe IT plants will be created. Maybe other um, industries will flourish. So that's an approach, but we're, as, as I said, we're at the very, very beginning, um, we're working with ministries. So this business case becomes a different business case.
Yeah. We love, uh, there are two questions starting with the second one. We love doing maintenance because you're a happy customer. You come back, we might make money on you again. So yes, we do lots of maintenance. Growing amount. We actually now have um, a service where we go to the people's homes and install the computers and so on. Um, and it's in our core mission. The increasing of the lifespan is our core mission. So that is our core. We, we expand on that business every day. And we asked, on this materiality matrix, we actually did lots of interviews, and we asked producers of IT. And they said, first of all, we're never going to be real competition. That's what they told us. Maybe we're that cheeky at some point we might be, but in the moment we're not. And we have lots of devices who are not built for you as consumers. So there's a total different market. And in the moment, the people who buy new computers will always buy new computers. That's the thinking, right? And there's a secondary market where they buy used devices, right? So they don't see a competition. Um, we are actually now working with producers of those devices to build the market for used devices because they don't have a consumer market. Because every person as a consumer has a Lenovo or might have a Lenovo. You know the brand, you might go to your IT guy and go, hey, I want a Lenovo, I don't want a Dell, HP or whatever, right? But if you don't have a consumer brand, you, you don't know about this device and you, you're, you wouldn't go to your IT guy and say, I want a Lenovo, right? So what we're now building on is actually building this market for used devices because then the people see that it's high quality even if it's four years old. So building a brand where, it, well, multiple brands, whether you see that devices are sustainable as well. So it's a market building. I mean, we are extending the whole IT market, which is growing anyway. Um, we're increasing the IT devices in the market. Um, but what we have in the moment um, is our large competitors are huge companies. They produce new devices and they actually take them from the market and sell them somewhere else. That's normally the international business part. So um, there are multiple, multiple competitors in that market, but the brands even like us for what we do because it's a positive message on, on their devices and the increase speaks for their devices as well. We just no, no. Um, we um, we do not remove because you're going to see that it's a, what device it is anyway. We don't remove brands. The brands like us because we actually help them grow the market space and, and the awareness. Um, the only thing we do is if a company has a, a, a company label on it, we erase that so nobody knows that my device used to be in a company X or Z. Um, that's the only part we do. Um, what I finally want to talk about, if anybody has any questions, no? good. What I'm, I'm observing in the moment. Um, until now, we had large companies doing CSR reporting to their stakeholders. I showed you my map. I told you that we're reporting up by a German standard. I'm reporting to specific target audiences. And what I found out, I don't know if the wording is right, but that's, as my stakeholders told me, they want transparency. They want to know that we know about our risks, how to mitigate them. They want to know what we do, what we don't do, where we, where we are and what we don't do. So there's a huge, that everybody's talking to a lots of people, right? What happened in the last year, and you've probably seen this from the other guys, as well as sustainable development goals. You know that they got seven goal, 17 goals, 169 sub goals, and so on. This is changing because now not everybody's running everywhere, they're running towards one direction. And this is what I found very funny. And the no, normal corporates, they don't know that yet, but they're gonna start reporting to one stakeholder, and that's the government. And the government has to report to the UN. And by that, you have common goals. So uh, we have the same goal as Siemens. We have the same goal as your butcher down the road. We have the same goal as a university. And we can start comparing each other and saying, look what my contribution is. So I can compare myself with a butcher, with a university, with a huge corporate, and we've we got a, a level playing field now. 
So it's a huge change in thinking. So it's not only um, transparency and saying, what do I do? But what am I contributing to mitigating all these problems we actually have? So there's a huge change in, 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 um, in, in reporting and the management. And what I like about it, is, and that's where we come in again, um, the working together with those companies to actually increase the impact. Because what we found out, we looked at all these standards and the SDGs, what is our contribution to the companies to fulfilling the, the, the goals and the other indicators? And we found out, we talked to lots and lots of people, that we have a huge impact on every reporting standard. So we're increasing the rating of every company, the ranking of their sustainability reports, and we're contributing or helping them, even if it's a nuclear power plant who builds weapons, we are increasing their social and environmental impact on a measured basis. And this is what not many companies are doing in the moment. Um, we wrote down um, lots of papers, guidelines, and so on, to help other companies to actually understand what we do, which impact we have, and write it in their reports, and actually help them communicate this a bit more. So which, what we're, what we're going to do in the next couple of months, actually talk to a thousand people, or a thousand companies basically, and tell them, guys, take us in out your sustainability report and contrib contribute that to the higher governments where you, they collect the data. And this is going to be a trend that's going to um, change lots of reporting standards. It's, you already can see that. The Global Reporting Initiative is already changing that. Global Compact is changing. Everybody's changing that they report and streamline it to one direction. Basically, um, we love if they work with us because basically we still work on our same business. We take computers, erase them, and sell them again. With that, we have a social and environmental impact. The only thing, what we're teaching them now, and that's with pieces of paper, with an email, with a PDF, is telling them where to put us in their sustainability reports. Because they're, they're looking for stories. They're looking for impact. They're looking of ways to increase their rating and rankings that, which are out there. Yes. So, and for them, then, so maybe, so to me it sounds a little bit like you're saying, okay, work with us, mm. so that you can put it into your, uh, in, into your sustainability report. It's one of the arguments, yes, one of them. Well, in, in many cases, they are donating devices to us, so we fulfill our social mission. But at the same time, why, in, in, the, in the most cases, 90% of the cases, the custom, our, my counterpart in the large corporates, they don't know about us. Because the IT department has a business need, a classic business need. They need the devices erased. That's a classical business need of every uh, corporate. There's a law that you have to be responsible for your data. So we take that business need and we fulfill it by raising the data. And as an absolute plus um, to differentiate from our competitors, we actually provide, we, well, we actually do that, right? Provide social and environmental impact. The only thing we're doing now differently than compared to the last 14 years, we're helping them that they communicate it a bit stronger. Because we, we're in a very competitive market. One of our competitors is in the, in the Forbes list on place 413 or something. Huge company. They make billions. We make very small millions. Right? So we're competing on a very, very strong market. So we need very strong arguments. And this, I think that's going to that's gonna change in the next few months. That a lot more companies are actually going to tell their customers, hey, look what I'm doing for you. And that's changing. That's what I, I'm trying to um, 
um, tell you about this is that the, the whole way of communicating and transporting classical business benefits on a sustainable way because there is a real impact and we are very conservative about our data. We don't want to do any greenwashing. We want to invite you guys. You can look at it. You can check it. You can look at it. Whatever you, you find is wrong with it, we'll change it. Um, because it's a very, very risky part. But we took all this data. We verified it. We took it um, into peer reviews. So the quality of the data is very strong. So our customers are more happy. They can write 10 pages, we're not going to verify it. We're going to tell them you had an impact on one person, max. And that's when only writing one person, it might be 00001, but I'm not going to start in splitting people. We have, um, it's our, our um, um, social environmental certificate we actually provide, and it says impact one person, and, and you see the carbon footprint is next to nothing if they gave us five computers, because you at least, at least, need at least 600 notebooks to have a higher impact as on one person. So they don't get anything. And we have customers from the weapons industry. We got huge energy providers who have nuclear power plants. We have, we have, we got the whole shebang. We try to get Coke. We didn't get them, right? Um, we actually look who we're working with and say, we, we create the impact and we invite you all to look at what we do, talk to our guys, um, so you actually see the real impact. And we did lots of greenwashing at the beginning. We did it. We told the biggest, greatest lies we can find. It was trendy to do that. Everybody did it, right? I didn't like that. I changed that a bit. That's why we're reporting. That's why I do peer reviews. That's why I check that. That's why I challenge you guys to visit us. That's why I challenge everybody to visit us. Look at us. Find, find the, the problem that we can solve it. And that's, that's where we can channel, if, even if a weapon selling nuclear power plant, the worst of the worst, tells, hey, we did something with AFB. We, we did the impact. So we can really steer that and um, be the storyteller on that one. So we love working with evil people because if you all discriminate them they're going to go broke and we get more computers at the end of the day bigger impact any more questions because i'm finished thanks guys